the ministry portion before we go into God's Word. Give you an opportunity to do that. I believe that if you are have children in your home, whether that's mama and papa, and an aunt and uncle, mom and dad, it could be that the most important message you ever listen to in a church could be today. And uh, it's possible that I'll offend you. And, uh, uh, but I want you to know that I'm not here to do that. I'm here to bless you. Yeah, and the wisest man, Scripture tells us, that was born of a man. Mm -hmm. That's all men, include, excluding Jesus. Right. Was man named Solomon, son of David. He was king. And when he became king, he asked the Lord to give him wisdom so he could do that well. Because mm -hmm. he was young. <coughs> and he knew the responsibility was big. And God answered his prayer in this way. Scripture tells us that God imparted wisdom directly into Solomon's mind here and into his heart. And scripture tells us that no man born before him nor after was more wise than Solomon. And he wrote what we're fixing to read. If you have your copy of Scripture, uh, you can go to it. This is uh, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. And he writes that for us to train up a child the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And the teaching of Solomon, the wisest guy that's ever existed, is important for us to look at. We need to pay attention to that. We don't read Proverbs much anymore. And I, I want to encourage you to, to, to maybe consider revisiting right. that wisdom. It's there for a reason. Why is that? How many of you have heard that when children are born, they don't come with an instruction manual? I've heard that all my life. I want to tell you that I believe that is a lie right. of hell. Right. There is an instruction manual that was given to us for every child that was ever born by the creator of that child, mm -hmm. by the giver of the life. Uh -huh. Jehovah, Yahweh. Right. Before Abraham was born, Jesus says, I am. Right. He is Yahweh, the giver of life. And we have a manual for training children. But let's look at Solomon's writing. Train up a child in the way he should go. Because another thing that's entered today is in our culture, we have a lot of go-tos for parenting. For those who actually have a desire to, to make a difference in the child's life, there's resources all over the place, all over the map, every place you can go to. And the parents that <coughs> care about their children and are looking at them, maybe you're one of them. But there's another thing that parents have been told is the right way to raise their children, and that's to farm that out. Hmm. Somebody else needs to do that for me. It's my job to get my child into the right school, and if they have the right teacher, they have the right football coach, the right volleyball coach, the right this coach, the right Dixie League leader, the right little dribblers person. If I can plug them into those kind of things and they can go into the right programs that they'll learn the right things, get them to the right Sunday school teacher, get them to the right pastor, someone else but me. Turn up a child the way you should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. There's another school of thought that's out there that when a child is young, they need no correction because if you correct them, they'll learn to fear you. 
And if a child is afraid of his mama, his daddy, his uncle, his aunt, his mama, his papa, that they are wrong. Because they instill fear into that child. In other words, if the child fears you when you when they've done something wrong, you're the problem, not the child. Fear of God is beginning with wisdom in the right. same book. Yep. If it's wrong for me to be afraid of my daddy, meaning that my daddy is the problem, my daddy is the sinner, then God is a sinner. Mm -hmm. We have reason to be afraid of God if we do things that are wrong. That's right. We don't follow His will. And if we <laughs> learn the, the fear of Him, it saves us. That's right. Brings us to grace. You have no need to fear. And children today struggle so yeah. much with the idea of grace that they're walking in a grace that's what we call really <coughs> cheap. Everyone sins. That's the reason Jesus was sin. I agree with that. But behind that kind of statement is the idea that I need not fear when I do sin. You not need to fear when you do sin because that, that's the reason Jesus came. And that today we shouldn't have to worry about those kinds of things. You know how I think about it? Train up a child in the way you should go. He kind of sacrificed himself on the cross. So in the way he should go is what I want us to look at right now because I want to take away the idea from the Hebrew that we should wait to train a child. In the way he should go is one word in Hebrew. And that word means this. And picture this as I say it. Up the mouth of his path. Picture that in your mind. Where does the path start for a child? Where's the mouth? Starts at birth. Starts at birth. You got it right. That's when the light shines. Training that the most wisest man that's ever existed on the face of the earth is instructing us to start that training from the day one. What do we teach you? Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now before we actually read what we're going to look at, I want to ask you, what is Deuteronomy chapter 5? Anybody remember? Let me give you a hint. It's the same thing as in Exodus chapter 20. <laughs> it's the Ten Commandments. Our government... The Supreme Court of this land has declared chapter 5 of Deuteronomy and chapter 20 of Exodus off limits for our children. And I want, to, I want you to listen to the reasoning inside the decision that was presented for what, why that's bad to have in the classroom. A Supreme Court Justice actually wrote what I'm going to share with you. The reason those Ten Commandments are wrong to have in the classroom is because children might read those. And if they read those, guess what might happen? They might obey those. Yeah, that's good, though. And if they read and obey <laughs> That would be active participation and support of Christianity with U.S. taxpayer money. And we can't have that. But no, it's all, it's all good. And that's the reason it was ruled against. <laughs> now, what do we have in today? Have you seen any anger issues with children? Oh, yeah. Do have anybody shooting each other? Oh, yeah. No, we're in church. They can't deal in any problem with theft? Do you know one of the number one reasons for uh, new businesses starts in this country failing is employee theft? Yeah, that too. Like, like, it's not, it's not just people coming in from inside looting. It's, it's people you hire that are stealing from you. The reason you can't, can't make it. We have any problems with infidelity in marriage today? Mm -hmm. 
Who has not been touched with that? Raise your hand. Uh, Those are all in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> They're all there. Now, wouldn't it be a shame if children read that, obeyed it? What would that happen? What would happen in our country if they did? Chapter 5 is the Ten Commandments. Now we're going to look at what we're supposed to do with that chapter in, in, in chapter 6. Let's, let's begin reading with verse 1. Let's just do that. And then we'll, then we'll get into the meat. Deuteronomy is a chapter, is, is basically a, a sermon series by Moses at the end of his life, preparing Israelites to do without him, reminding them of what God has been teaching them over the last uh, uh, four decades. Verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord, your God. Oh my goodness, we've been instructed to fear Him? He said, well, you know, Joey, that just means awe and respect. It does. I agree with that. But it doesn't just mean right, awe and respect. Do you know what fear is in the Hebrew when you look in the dictionary for Hebrew? Fear. Fear. <laughs> It's actually, I mean, that's what it is. Right. It's okay to be afraid when you do something wrong. Right. It helps us to be afraid when we do something wrong. I'm in a lot of different churches. I was in a park with some young people from our churches and their little ones. About this age. About a year and a half, one of them. And they got ready to leave. One of the couples got ready to leave. And, and the little girl didn't want to go. And the daddy picked her up to take her to the car, and she just jack slapped her. Yeah, Rock off something. She's dedicated to that. You know what he did? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen that in church. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be the that would be the fear is wrong. Our understanding of it before we come to God comes from our understanding of fear of our mom and dad. That's right. That's right. So that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all His statutes and His commandments, which are commanding all the days of your life, and that your days might be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen. And be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. No nation on the face of this earth is more blessed than this one. The United States. Our congressman, who is retired, did not run for re-election, made this statement about two months before... He finished up. But where is it? It's Louis Gomer. Because we got the right ideology. And this is what he said. <laughs> How many Second Amendment supporters do we have in here? I'll raise my hand on that. I like the third one. I like all of them. This is what he said. If you're a Second Amendment supporter, don't expect that amendment to survive in a nation that doesn't teach its children the difference between right and wrong. That's, right. That's also That's the foundation, right. too, if you think about it. If you take away the foundation, the whole structure falls. So the best way for you to support the Second <laughs> Amendment <laughs> is not to vote for politicians that say they want to keep it. It's to teach children the difference between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to get to the meat. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk with them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals 
on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You talking about the scripture? Question. Did Moses leave anything out? No. He covered it all. So the scripture is not something that the child is supposed to get on Wednesday night and Sunday morning. Every day. The scriptures are something that a child is supposed to be getting, and me and you are supposed to be getting throughout our day, every day of every week of every year. They're supposed to be core, they're supposed to be central. I live in a nation current that is so corrupt that the corruption goes through everything that's in it. And I watch the suffering of Ghanaians because of it. And I see it coming through here. Yep. It's growing. It's yep. like cancer. Yep. Uh, the darkness won't last very long. And here, not with the light. We have an instruction book for our race children, and we're not following. Technically, they're not getting the the core beliefs. Now, look at what it says here about who is teaching. Teach your sons. Okay. In order for someone to be called a teacher of sons, he has to be called what by the son? Father. Father. Mm. It's another struggle we're having. Well, actually, anybody can teach them. A lot of our fathers have checked out. They're producing children with women who are not their wives, and they bail out after they've done that. So who fills in the gap? I'm the father of fathers. Mm -hmm. It's the men in this room. The ones that are committed to Christ. We are the fathers of even the fatherless. If you have a young lady coming in here reaching for, for Christ for her and her family and she has no husband, we are to embrace that lady and we are to take her children under our wing and we are to be enforcing and encouraging and giving that word to them so that they might watch. Seek seek salvation up in the fear of our God. So that when the grace of Jesus is presented to them, they'll run it. Grab a hold of it, embrace it, and live it. Well, let's say that I do that. In order to do that, major changes would have to be taking place in my home. Is it worth it? Does God's Word actually do good things? Would my child actually read it and then actually obey it? There's a lot of things that go into that mix. I can't actually read this, but I'm going to tell you. This is not about Republicans or liberals and conservatives. This is not a blue side and a red side in that way. As a matter of fact, the blue side here is actually the good side. If you're not uh, well, it kind of, in, 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 of that landing, I know what county I'm in, in the state of Texas. They kind of have their... So, they study from age 18 to 23, the average young person that's raised in a church in the United States, between age 18 and 23, leaves the church and never comes back. Eight out of ten. This study is not about those eight. This study is about the two that stay. What were the influences on their lives? What was important to them enough in their upbringing that they made a decision when they became an adult and they could choose to be here or not be here, what influences in their lives made them say yes to God's people church when they could make their mind up for, their, for themselves? The people around you and these are the influences. 
And the, the bigger the bar to the right, the stronger the influence. Uh, they had more than one sibling in the house that attended church with them. Parents pointed out biblical principles in everyday life. Parents typically asked forgiveness when they messed up in the house. Uh, child connected with several adults at church who intentionally invested in him. Now listen to that. That's important. The child is a female. I mean, there's more young ladies in church, and that's, that's typical. Not just here, it's also in God. That's good. They got a warm field. Child's best friend was an influence to follow Christ while growing up. Child participated in church mission trips and, product, uh, uh, and projects. Child listened primarily to Christian music. Uh, this is a stronger influence than some of the ones down below it. That should tell you, parent, that music is important. It is. And can, it's Child regularly served in church while growing up. Child regularly spent time in prayer while growing up. Now look at the top one. It's double the next strongest influence below it. And I believe it's the source for everything under it. Scripture intake was the number one influence on that young adult that said yes to the church when they had an opportunity to say no. Well, it can also My children growing up didn't have an opportunity to say no. Uh, like, like, I didn't give them that. They, had, they did not have that freedom. But all three of them are in church today, and they had that liberty. And they all got scripture growing up. Every single one. Now, there's an organization in the United States called the Center for Bible Engagement. They did a survey on 40,000 people. Not just Christians, this is just, and the age group was 8 to 80 years old. I mean, that's, that's a big, gigantic bunch of folks. <laughs> yeah. And the survey was extensive. They wanted to know, what do you do? What behaviors, what are your beliefs, what are your feelings? I mean, it was broad and big. And then they, after they got all those results and tabulated them, they compared it to whether or not the person had how much scripture they had going into them. They wanted to see if scripture had any correlation with how a person lives. And they found something they were not looking for. If a person has one scripture encounter a week, that scripture encounter has virtually zero effect on their behavior. They behave just like someone who never got in. But our attention span. Two scripture engagements a week had the same effect as one. No change in their behavior. Three. On the third scripture exposure of the week, they had a tiny, tiny, but and barely noticeable, but still noticeable change in behavior. Not much. So basically the scriptures coming three times a week into a person has very little effect on how they live. Wednesday night. Sunday morning. Sunday evening. Church looks just like the world. Hmm. Not much difference. But, it's always but let me tell you what happened when day four came. This is what they weren't expecting. When day four, four days or more of scripture engagement from a person is experienced on a weekly basis, it had a radical change in their behavior. Let me just give you some of them from this chart. Feeling of loneliness drops 30%. No matter how isolated I am from the world, God is with me when I read the word. Anger issues drop 33%. Do we have any problem with young people having anger issues today? Struggling to control their anger? 
Even grown ups. Even grown ups. <laughs> I mean, I know some of you are thinking that those big problems take place in scary places like Chicago and New York and maybe L.A., but we're okay here in Roseville. You're not okay here in Roseville. It's here too. Alcohol, a bitterness in relationship drops 40%. We're not talking about small impacts on, on life. We're talking huge impacts. Alcoholism drops 57% when someone engages scripture four days a week or more. Does God's word impact life? Yes. If you take it in. Absolutely. Sex outside of marriage. The number one thing on the list of the don't do's drops 68%. How many marriages would be saved? How many suffering children who had no say in what their mom and dad chose to do, how much of their suffering would be eliminated simply from taking in God's Word four days or more a week? Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing pornography drops 61%. On any given Sunday morning, it's estimated that half of the men sitting on a church pew have viewed pornography in the week before they sat there. And they're in that church on that morning guilty. They, it's not something they want to be doing. It's something they're struggling with and they're making bad decisions and they're hurting. You want a weapon to fight that with? God's Word can give you the power to overcome it. 61% view less pornography as a result of hearing God's Word. Sharing your faith. Some Christians go to church all their lives and never do it. That jumps 200%. Actively engaged in the disciple making. I want you to follow Christ with me as I follow Christ. I want you to experience His love as I walk with Him so you also can experience in that love. That increases 230% as a result of taking in the Scriptures for their moral week. And it's rare. <laughs> Why is four days or more a week a reason for these things happening and three days a week is not? Well, I can't tell you that there is a study out there that I could go to that answers that question. But let me make a suggestion to you. The suggestion is this. From three days a week or more, it's because someone else is doing it for your child. Right. Mm -hmm. And when it goes to four days and more, it means mm -hmm. that someone in the home has right. decided to make that teaching their responsibility. Mm -hmm. And to do it. Mm -hmm. You know what the number one reason given for people not reading scripture on a regular basis? <laughs> I'm just too busy. I don't have time. Let me interpret what that response is actually saying. God's not a priority in our house. Mm -hmm. We have other priorities. You can still speak to him. That's basically what that means. My life is full of other priorities, and that one just doesn't fit. Some of you may or may not know that I'm an old school teacher. And uh, I taught down in Burkeville for four years. I taught in the military before that. And I'm still teaching today, but just not in public setting. And, uh, but in my first year of teaching, something came out. Some of you may remember it. It, was a, it went out in the magazines. It was on the news. Johnny can't read. That was, that was the problem in America. Was that Johnny can't read. In other words, people in America, young people, are not learning how to read well. So we had this big meeting in the library at Burger. All the teachers came in, and they presented this, why Johnny can't read, and and uh, we had these open forums discussed between teachers and, and those kind of, you know, what, what, could we, what could be the problem here in Burkeville and what could we do to fix that? 
And I'm listening to all this because I'm the rookie in the room. It's my first year of teaching. I'm supposed to what? I'm supposed to hide in a corner and just soak it in and not say anything. And I'm doing that. I'm trying my best to do that. But I remember after listening to all those folks talking about why Johnny can't read, and I thought to myself, is it possible? I'm thinking that the reason Johnny can't read is because Johnny doesn't read. Hey, I did read a book for mm -hmm. that's cool. That's right. We can do what we practice. That's right. You just gotta educate yourself. And we can read it. I, I, I know that doesn't solve everybody's problem. There's some folks with some legitimate reasons for struggling with reading. But the overwhelming majority of us, that's not the problem. Because we're not doing it. They just don't want to read. See, I didn't want to read. Is it possible? <laughs> That the reason America is not obeying the Ten Commandments is because America is not reading. That would be because the, the world's full of greed and deceit, and that's the devil's work. Is that possible? And it's not possible. Let's consider that. And what I want to suggest to you today in this teaching I presented, as, as well as a message, is that we can make changes that work. Now, so you'll know. that I too need this message. This is what my front porch looks like at 5.45 in the morning, six days a week in West Africa. <laughs> I have a house full of kids that aren't mine, but they are mine, because yeah. God's given them to me. Right. And they've be, been with me for years. you got to be a, a beacon that shines. And they're going to a school that's teaching them the Bible. They're already getting it at school. They worship in that school every Wednesday. They have an assembly in the morning where they sing to Jesus and pray to Him. They have an assembly at closing where they sing to Jesus and pray to Him. That's already happening every day of the week. But we started this Bible reading, and it lasts from 5.45 to about 6.15, 6.20, 6.25, something like that. And they're reading this in Ewa, which is not my language, but it's theirs. And in three years they've read all of Genesis, They've read all of Exodus. They've read all of Deuteronomy. They've read Judges. They've read, uh, they've read Joshua. They've read 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. They're almost finished with Proverbs. Uh, they've read Galatians. Uh, they're in Luke right now. And every morning they're reading it together. And remember earlier when I told you at our celebration we had eight readers? that were selected by their teachers, not me, to be the airway reader that morning. Only one of them isn't on my porch. <laughs> Six days a week, reading that way. So what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting two things. Access to the scriptures in written format and requires the ability to read the scriptures in the written format. What about the part <coughs> that requires practicing practicing and reading with your children? We're not obeying the scriptures because we're not reading. Is it possible that you could bless your home by putting the two together? Right. Mm -hmm. right. They could learn how to read and do that with the scriptures. Yeah. And get the benefit yeah. of both at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and your world could be blessed. Our America could change. The Second Amendment could survive, as well as all the other blessings that we have enjoyed in this country. And we could continue to be a beacon of light in a world that needs to have light because it's growing darker and darker. But there's something about the follow the darkness. But let me just encourage you that if you're the only one in this room that wants to make a change in your house, and you're thinking, if I'm the only one, why do it if no one else is? Could be that at the close of the judgment, all those other homes are going to hear this from the Lord. Depart from me. Mm. I am new. But you and your children would be the ones who would hear, come. Come. Prepare to keep. Prepare to use.
foundation of the world. Amen. So as we come to our close today, I'm going to put something in front of you that's very important. If you haven't made it central in your house to take in the scripture for children, even if you don't have children at home, take them in for yourself. You haven't done that. Just for the inspiration. Is today a day when you could say, I want to do that in my home? They also have an app on your phone called Spring Full of Jesus. That gives you a if that's you, if you want to make this a day when you say yes, to making the scriptures core for your house, actively engaging them in the reading process. Would you just show me your hand? Amen. Hands all over the readers. This is what I want to encourage you to do. I want to encourage you today to make a stand for that, to make a statement for that in front of God and your church family. Your pastor's coming up during our off call time. And what I want to encourage you to do, if you have deacons in the church, you can come up because there may be more than he can handle, and declare your commitment in front of your church to him and ask him to pray for you. <coughs> now we're going to have an invitation. I don't know how you do that here. I'm going to turn that over to you, Cliff. And I want to encourage you, if you raise your hand, to come up and declare that commitment in his presence. I believe it will help you. I believe next week when he has a chance to see you and he asks you, how did that go this week? What kind of struggles did you have? Because I'm going to tell you, we had them in my house. When I first started getting them up at 5.45 to go read scripture, guess how many happies I got? <laughs> Not a lot. And there's still a struggle with one or two of them. Let me tell you a little short story, though, and then I'll turn it over because the struggles are worth it. We read all of Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy, and we were in Judges. We read Joshua. I don't know how many of you have read that book, but there's a statement in Joshua that's repeated over and over. And Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord again. God was in punishment. Then they would cry, and he'd say, over and over. We're about halfway, two-thirds of the way through the book of Judges, and that statement comes up again in LA and my porch is kind of like church. Everybody's got their spot. <laughs> and Kofi's spot was right next to me. And in indignation, he declared, when are they going to stop doing that? <laughs> Talk about teachable moments. You can have those teachable moments in your home. Take patience, perseverance, and a desire for your house to be centered on God's word. Your decision to do that can produce those moments for you and your home. Please. Let's dance. One number. 123. 123. Will you make a commitment? Right here today, will you make a commitment? And I'm going to make God's word a priority in my home. You make that commitment today. Amen. God's word is going to be a priority in my life.